hello and welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jakob Fagan. I'm the Associate Director of the Future of Capitalism program at the Bergruen Institute. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Lana Schwartz, Assistant Professor of Media Studies at the University of Virginia and a 2020 to 21 Bergruen Fellow. Dr. Schwartz's research focus, uh, focuses on the embeddedness of economic transactions within society, the medium of communication technology. She will be speaking about her new book with Yale University Press titled Money, How Payment Became a Social Media. The book examines the confluence of media and payment infrastructure. After a presentation, we will take a brief round of questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A feature or hit the raise your hand option on Zoom. This video will also be simulcast on YouTube. Dr. Schwartz. Thank you so much. I will share my screen. Great. Um, so I'm very pleased to be uh, talking with you all today about um, new money, um, how payment became social media. I'm going to touch on some of the themes of the book, some of the, you know, um, stories, um, and then a little sprinkling of some new work at the end. Um, oh, okay. So payment systems are used countless times a day. You know, we, our debit card is, um, uh, debited every time we go through a easy pass. Um, we have automatic charges happening when we don't even know it. We swipe, we tap, we sometimes even use cash and change. Um, and yet, you know, there, and, and so, you know, payment systems, whatever form, including cash, um, are some of one of the most important, uh, infrastructures of, of modern life. And, um, they are ubiquitous, and yet completely invisible and essential. Um, it's one of those things where, uh, as you know, science and technology scholars talk about, um, you never really notice something that, you never really notice the most important infrastructures until they break down. And payment infra systems, at least the United States, have for a very long time, I mean, relatively long time, since about the 1970s, um, been a siloed, slow moving, not particularly cool sector of the consumer financial services industry. And when I began to study them, I studied them at a moment of disruption, at a time when really the whole concept of fintech was being born, when um, entrepreneurs and activists and artists were dreaming about cryptocurrencies and local currencies and the sharing economy, which would very quickly become the gig economy. Um, and so, this, and, and this emerged at this um, moment following the 2008 financial crisis when it seemed like money was open to being reimagined um, and that that reimagining would come uh, via um, new technologies. So, you know, the, the, the dreams that the, the world that I've been immersed in for so long um, have for the future of money uh, are as much about big dreams as they are about big business. So change the money, change the world. So as a media and communication scholar, I situate money as a media and communication technology. So I think about communication as the sharing of information via media and, techno media and technology forms that produces a shared meaning or a shared reality. Um, and I argue that by looking at money in this way and looking at the kind of communication modality of money in this way, um, we are enabled to see new meaning and new politics. Um, so. You know, I, I think historically, it's, you know, it's quite interesting to look historically, which I do in quite some detail in the book, um, and see that the technologies of payment have long tracked along the technologies of communication more broadly. So, you know, print issued currency, print currency did many of the things that um, Benedict Anderson and, and others talk about um, print capitalism more generally doing as, you know, creating imagined communities, the size and scale of the nation state. Um, many people don't know this, but American Express actually started off as, as did Wells Fargo, um, although some of you Northern Californians might know this, um, as an express shipping company. So delivering the mail along with banknotes, bits of bullion from the gold rush, et cetera. Um, so in that sense, you know, this new technology, this new system of logistics that uh, delivered information, so too delivered money. Um, 
And uh, this third picture is actually a POS system. So you would swipe a card um, and you would dial up to the Visa MasterCard network using that rotary telephone. Um, and that sort of demonstrates the way that the early technologies of the internet um, were one and the same with the early technologies of, of POS systems. And in fact, you can still hear the like bing bong, bing bong of modem noises from like particularly sketchy ATMs at the back of certain bars um, all over the country. And of course, today, so many of our um, new, you know, the innovation we're seeing around payment are coming from the uh, technologies we use to communicate more generally, namely social and mobile media. I have found it quite useful to theorize the, um, the technologies of money as tokens, ledgers, and rails. These are kind of three different lenses for looking at and being able to describe the kind of material properties of, of money form, of money technology. So, you know, tokens being the unit of currency, which may or may not take a physical form, um, ledgers, the information systems that keep track of them, and also the rails, so the infrastructures that make tokens move. And I think by looking at these three, looking at payment systems through these three lenses, it helps us see the communicative politics of money. So symbolic in the sense of tokens, which may be, you know, uh, decorated with um, iconography that produces, uh, you know, shared shared meaning. Um, informational in the sense of ledgers. Um, both in you know, this early paper ledger, but also in thinking in terms of transactional data and who will be its stewards. And then finally, distributional when thinking about rails. How does the money move? What causes accidents? Or what, you know, what, at what point does that um, movement get gummed up? What are the kind of invisible boundaries that are built into the systems that allow money to move? I've also, in thinking about payment is a form of communication um, in the sense that it's a way of transmitting information that produces shared meaning and a shared reality, um, have begun to think about the way that payment, shared payment, knits us together in a shared economic world, which I call a transactional community. So a set of relations that are produced through the act of transactional communication. Um, you know, it's if, if people who use the same money form may have little in common, but at least they believe that the money that they are transacting with will be worth something tomorrow, otherwise they wouldn't accept it. Um, and, and they're willing to sustain and perform and shore up uh, the belief that in, in the value, politics, um, temporality that relate to that money as a communication media. So. In that sense, money as a communication media performs a relationship between people in the moment of transactions, as well as relations between individuals and larger imaginaries we call the economy and society. Um, so a transactional community is in many ways a community of shared belief. Um, and of course, I want to be clear that when I say transactional community, I mean to partake of neither the normative negative connotations of transactional nor the normative romantic connotations of community. Um, rather, I'm interested in understanding what kind of kind of social totality emerges um, through the act of communication. Um, and one of the first ways I really um, one of the, the examples that really brought me to kind of thinking in this way is the case of the Indo-Greeks, which is, um, you know, whose coin is represented on the screen. Um, so the Indo-Greeks lived in the modern border of Afghanistan, Uzbekistan for about, you know, 180 BC to 10 AD. And they are only knowable as a transactional community today. Um, archaeologists describe how the only real remaining evidence of them is the coins they left behind. They're able to map their territory. They're able, archaeologists are able to divine political change from the tiny portraits. Um, they're able to read ethnicity in the numbering systems that mark value. Um, and so, um, like coins as an ancient payment system called the Indo-Greek civilization to be, into being and can be used to uncover it. Similarly, as I've sort of gestured before, modern state currency was designed to enact transactional communities the size and scope of the nation um, and to, you know, yoke the um, 
transactional community to the nation state. Um, using cash pulls people, or state issued currency, could be in the form of cash, you know, pulls people together um, in a community of shared fate and using it is a, a ritual of citizenship. Um, of course, we know that you don't have to be a citizen to use a, um, to use cash. And I think it's interesting to kind of look at the difference between the two. Um, and finally, I, I have thought, I probably know more about the Diners Club card than, uh, than anyone should. Um, but Diners Club card was the first universal third party payment card that emerged in the 1950s. And I argue remediated state issued currency, creating a private closed um, transactional community um, that allowed business travelers, um, mostly, you know, elite white men, um, to be able to travel at the scope and scale of their money. So anywhere they went, anywhere their card was accepted, they would be welcomed. And, um, and this, yeah, and so this um, created this like invisible distributed country club, essentially. So invariably, when I am doing research or talking to um, fintech communities, <laughs> um, someone comes up, you know, and wants to talk to me about the history of money. And invariably, it's this very clear kind of evolutionary narrative that starts with shelves and moves to barter, and then we figure out gold, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it almost always ends with Bitcoin. Um, and 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 it always, so it always, always, it almost always semi ends with modern money in the form of, you know, market state issued currency that is fully fungible, fully universal, fully free of meaning um, other than economic meaning. And then, of course, um, but that is just kind of like a stop on the way to to Bitcoin. But I argue that seeing money as a communication technology and media allows us to denaturalize this just so story, allows us to see money technologies as something that have and can be designed for particular purposes. And I hope that that can open up some room for agency or optimism about designing the money we want and therefore the transactional communities and larger uh, worlds that we want to live in. So. Historically, money has been plural. So, you know, um, in the United States, for example, state issued currency uh, wasn't fully consolidated until well after the Civil War. And before that point, foreign currency, um, pro uh, employer issued script, such as this from the Carter Cole Company, um, banknotes issued by local regional banks. Um, all circulated alongside some that had were you know federally issued notes and people even like you know largely illiterate population was able to navigate this very complex transactional world um and you see guides such as this thompson's guide here that helps people figure out if the coin or note that they were dealing with was um real or fake was it from a, a bank that was defunct was it something that Maybe people will take in Philadelphia, but they won't take in New York. Um, and so learning to kind of live with this plurality was an important part of everyday financial lives. Also, historically, money has been unequal. So um, for the most part, um, you know, the money that wealthy people used in everyday life was very different from money that poor people used in everyday life. Poor people mostly transacted in the form of what was called petty coin, these kind of low value metal tokens that could be used to pay for things um, in you know, of little value that they could use in everyday life. Whereas wealthy people typically put things um, on accounts or use letters of credit. And so the kind of difference here, the, the stratification in money form was not simply a matter of quantity, you know, who has more money than someone else, but of quality. So, you know, what kinds of monies um, can be transacted with? And, and you know, it's there, uh, Eric Helliner, who's a geographer, described this as, um, you know, there was no real exchange rate between um, money of the rich and money of the poor. Um, and I would say, you know, that they lived in very different transactional communities. So when state currency, and I know that I'm not using a state currency here, I'm using a territorial currency here, um, when that came came in and sort of replaced some of this um, monetary variegation, replaced some of these um, uh, 
some of this um, uh, difference. Um, it, yeah, it like, I think of it as like housemanizing. So this like this, you know, the, in Paris, there were all these like little nooks and crannies and tiny streets that were all basically torn down and big, bold, modern boulevards were built in their place. So all of these kind of monetary nooks and crannies were kind of mowed over um, to make way for this kind of mass media of, of and, and to produce the kind of large scale uh, transactional community yoked to the nation state. Um, one uh, historian, Eugene Weber, talks about how uh, the Frank turned peasants into Frenchmen, um, and perhaps the Euro turns uh, Frenchmen into Europeans, or maybe not. Um, but there is still a lot of plurality um, and a lot of difference in the kinds of money that we use every day the kind, and that are built into the payment systems that remediate state issued currency. So um, I, I often ask people, especially my students, when I teach to, we always do a, a activity where they dump out their wallets, open up their cards, and really look at all the different money technologies they use every day. Um, so, you know, and then some things are more surprising. So for example, in the United States, EBT cards, so, you know, welfare cards are programmed, designed, so that they can't be used to buy hot food. So that means that you can't buy, if you're using an EBT card, you can't buy a hot rotisserie chicken, which is one of like the best deals at the supermarket. But if that hot rotisserie chicken is removed from the hot case and put into a refrigerated case, then you can buy it. So um, it's, it's designed to create these, uh, these kind of, make these kind of strange moral choices. Um, of course, you know, some cards come with tremendous privileges. The Chase Sapphire Reserve is notorious for being a, the newest, greatest elite card, which confers access to hidden realms of, um, you know, airport lounges. Uh, and, and prepaid cards are notoriously, um, notoriously expensive. So it's sort of, you know, the poorer you are, the more expensive it is to use your money. Um, I'm also really interested in other forms of, you know, new money forms, such as the Starbucks uh, reward points, which are built to expire. So we can, we can kind of imagine and begin to develop a, a grammar of how um, money can be designed. I also think it's important then at this moment of innovation, at this, you know, fintech explosion to really, really look deeply and really try to understand the way these systems actually work. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine and something I've been really trained to, uh, trained to think about as a scholar of communication technology is to not kind of say like, oh, the algorithms did a bad thing, but to really, really unpack what actually happened when something goes wrong. Um, so I have spent a lot of time methodologically, um, and that kind of comes through in the book, mostly in the form of what I think are interesting stories and not just like boring recitations of how payment systems work. Um, look at how new fintech products are overlaid onto legacy systems in ways that are sometimes quite kludgy um, and ultimately have uh, you know negative consequences for ordinary people, not because they've been designed that way, but because um, you know there's been neglect um, in the way that these systems are imagined. And this is a very interesting case study that I have a whole chapter on, and I'd be happy to talk about it in Q and A. So another, th so ultimately, you know, the whole book is kind of pointing towards thinking about the future of these transactional communities. You know, I don't think that state issued currency is going anywhere and neither is cash for that matter. All the data we have from the Federal Reserve shows that, um, you know, cash use is not down. But I do think we will be seeing um, a, an emergence of, of, of plurality. Um, and we will see, we will begin to be members of different transactional communities and our position within those transactional communities alongside the transactional communities themselves will be stratified. Um, I'd like to, you know, th this first, this WEX fleet, this is actually a credit card that is a fleet card or gas card used by truckers in the United States. Um, and much like the way Chase Sapphire Reserve opens access to hidden realms of uh, of, of airport lounges, this opens access to hidden realms of special rows of gas tanks, special places to park. Um, and, and the people who, who 
owner operators who use these cards and drive trucks all over the United, all over, you know, North, North America, um, are keenly aware of the rewards and the, um, additional capacity that being a member of this transactional community facilitates. So um, one trucker described it as food stamps for truckers that help when um, make ends meet. I also have been fascinated by the, you know, the transactional community that is um, WeChat Pay. So this is a picture of the, of, of, a WeChat pay sign in Vegas. Some of you can probably read this. I can't. I can't read all of it. Um, where basically you can, you know, uh, anyone who uses WeChat Pay um, can use uh, can use it to can, um, to pay for anything, with the exception of gambling, um, at all Caesars properties in Vegas. So you can imagine um, people communicating entirely through WeChat Pay to, with the people around them transacting fully in WeChat Pay, and in some ways never leaving the transactional community of China despite being in Vegas. So I'm really interested in the relationship to traditional notions of sovereignty and the way these new transactional technologies and the communities, communities they perform are less tied to geography, but nevertheless organize our movement through geography. Um, and it's not just Vegas. I happen to know that uh, there's a the Chinese restaurant on the UVA corner um, accepts WeChat Pay and regularly advertises in WeChat. Um, so, so I think you know. So yeah. So thinking about a future where where we're negotiating, much like people in antebellum U United States, a variety of different payment forms, but also membership in a variety of different communities. Um, and I've been really motivated by Anisha's work on modular citizenship here to think about what this might mean and what this might look like. You know, how is our traditional notions of sovereignty being disrupted um, and, what, and, and what comes next? Um, I think it's also important when thinking about the future to look at the lessons from Silicon Valley and social media more broadly. Um, social, Silicon Valley basically only has one form of governance, which is semi-automated moderation enforced by blanket um, uh, enforced by blanket bans and account freezes, um, and with very little accountability and largely anti-democratic. Um, and so, what it's important to think about how you know it's one thing if you're not able to access your Twitter account; it's another thing entirely if you're not able to access your money. Um, and I, I also, so, and when I talk about the future of money and talk about the future of transactional communities, most people want to talk to me about Bitcoin. And I've written quite a bit about Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies. I'm pretty immersed in that uh, scene or have been. Um, <laughs> but I tend to think, you know, people say things like Bitcoin is like the internet was in 1995. And I think it's true. So look at, and and by, what I mean by that is look at what happened with the internet. While we were so busy imagining decentralized, um, you know, libertarian utopias and, and making sure that the so-called, you know, cyberspace was free from the governments of the meat space, corporations came in and largely centralized, um, you know, cre erased any chance of, you know, of making a claim for, you know, a libertarian sort of utopia online. And so um, people laugh when Howard Schultz, CEO or former CEO of, of Starbucks said that, you know, the future of currency isn't Bitcoin. The future of currency um, will instead be issued by a few, as he put it, trusted brands. And he basically suggested that Starbucks would possibly um, be a important issuer of, of currency in the future. Um, and it's like, what a world we live in where then the marketing director of um, Dunkin' Donuts has to respond about whether or not they are planning to become like a, essentially a bank. Um, but, you know, people make fun of, of Schultz, but I actually think, okay, Starbucks has the most widely used, the most downloaded, the most used every day mobile payment app in the United States. Um, they have a very sophisticated, you know, fintech offering. They have more geographic reach in terms of both breadth and depth um, than the post office in the United States. So, you know, thinking about the, you know, what we like about postal banking um, in terms of geography, uh, you know, 
and access uh, Starbucks provides. And they already have something that looks a little bit like currency in the form of their, uh, their rewards points. So this, I'm, I'm kind of being tongue in cheek, but I'm kind of not. I think we need to take seriously the idea that state issued currency is going to be dis disintermediated in and sort of disrupted and replaced in, in meaningful ways, but it is unlikely to come from outsider political projects and more likely to come from corporate capitalism. Um, and I also think it's important to keep thinking about the things that are boring. So when Facebook Libra came out, you know, it created um, a huge backlash, you know, you know the, the, one of the most untrusted companies now seeking to create a global currency, sort of stuff of dystopian nightmares. And there was quite a bit of schadenfreude um, in the tech scene, in the fintech scene, um, when Libra seemed to be, you know, have a major failure to launch. However, it was largely unremarked upon when um, just very shortly after Libra's kind of failure, Facebook Pay was launched. You know, Facebook Pay has none of the kind of world changing revolutionary aspirations of Libra, um, but could accomplish many of the same things Libra seeks to do and could accomplish, you know, fulfill many of the um, you know, dystopian visions that that were spelled out when we imagine, you know, Facebook turning its imperial attention to money. Um, so the tokens are often the kind of uh, uh, the site where we are able to like tell political stories, but it's the rails that are almost always um, just as interesting and just as important. So um, I, here's like an overlay of some of the things I talk about in the book. Here's the uh, table of contents. I've given sort of a broad overview, but each chapter goes in depth in um, you know, thinking about the history of money as communication, thinking about the kinds of identities that are assembled through money, thinking about explaining in detail the mechanisms of getting paid and what happens when you can't get paid because of a failure of payment rails, um, thinking about uh, big about data and social payments, um, privacy, that sort of thing. Um, and then again, you know, really looking to the future. I only have a few moments left and I want to be able to have a conversation with Jakob and the rest of you, but I do just want to signal to my two new projects um, that are surprisingly interconnected. Um, so the first, which is what I really proposed for my fellowship, was uh, to think about scams. So 2016, 2018, 2019, strangely not 2017, um, have all been described as the year of the scam. Um, you know, we're fascinated with scams right now, and I'm really interested in trying to figure out why. I have begun to theorize scams as kind of capitalism out of place. What we call a scam is used to kind of perform boundary work that legitimates certain forms of economic activity and, and exploitation and delegitimate others. Um, and of course, I have learned so much about scams um, through payment systems and also through living in the crypto space and have a lot of notes, a lot of outtakes. Um, and and so I, I want to both, you know, understand the contestation that we're living in now between legitimate and illegitimate capitalism um, and the way that that contestation seems in, to increasingly be heated up and also to kind of tell a history of the internet through a history of internet scams. Um, so, and then the other project that I've been doing, which kind of emerged in response to COVID, um, is looking at the experience of small business owners um, in the, what I've been calling the kind of COVID liminality, um, who suddenly had to become, like all businesses sort of became online businesses in a moment of social distancing. Um, and small businesses are not widely studied in the, um, in communication and media studies at all, or anyone who kind of studies like the internet, but small businesses are increasingly assembled or constitute themselves via platforms, platforms for space, platforms for payment, platforms for shipping, platforms for co communicating with your customers, platforms for getting, um, you know, getting merchandise. It's, it's a, once you get into the world of like platforms for small businesses, you realize it's a whole industry that no one has really paid attention to. Um, and and I also think that the boundary between being an individual and being a business is increasingly becoming unsettled. Um, so I think it's important to understand that kind of oscillation uh, between experiencing platforms as a person and experiencing platforms as a, 
uh, form of livelihood. Um, and then all that is amplified in the context of COVID. Through that, I've also, um, in the interviews with small business owners, of course, um, wound up saying the paycheck protection program, which is the primary provision for small businesses under the CARES Act. Um, and thinking about what kind of money um, from a sociocultural perspective, the PPP is. Um, and I'm working with a student uh, along the, in addition to the interviews, I'm working with a student at UVA um, to do a large scale quantitative qualitative analysis of news coverage of the PPP and looking at um, the way that it's critiqued on the left for, for being insufficiently fulfilling an ethics of care and it's critiqued on the right for insufficiently fulfilling an ethics of dignity. So I'm pretty excited about all of these projects. And the way, the reason why I say they're surprisingly interrelated is believe it or not, there are lots of PPP scams and small business uh, social media scams. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad we have some time for conversation and uh, I look forward to chatting with you all. <laughs>